Good morning from London and welcome to RUSI. My name is Neil Melvin. I'm the Director of International Security Studies here at RUSI. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome everyone to this, the second in a series of four webinars that we're running in International Security Studies on the Indo-Pacific uh, region and its security challenges. Today, we're going to be looking at how the region fits into the UK's evolving foreign and security priorities. Uh, the next uh, event I'd like to just highlight will take place on the 24th of October, where we'll be looking at the impact of China's 20th Party Congress on Indo-Pacific security. So I hope you can also join us for that event. Today, as I mentioned, we're looking at the UK, where we have a, a new prime minister in the form of Liz Truss. And as part of her campaign to become the leader of the Conservative Party, uh, Prime Minister Truss put a lot of focus on security and defence issues, particularly the threats represented to the UK and its allies by Russia and China as state actors. And she also announced that the aim would be to build up the UK's defence budget by 2030 to up to 3% of GDP. Prior to taking up the role of uh, Prime Minister, Liz Truss was the Foreign Secretary, where she was implementing the Global Britain agenda of her predecessor, Boris Johnson, uh, which shaped the UK's post-Brexit UK role. With the new Prime Minister, there's now a question about whether the UK will continue with the same foreign and security policy priorities that we had under the previous government. Will Global Britain continue to be the focus of the UK's external policies? Two key regions that are likely to shape this agenda are Europe and the Indo-Pacific region. Global Britain, which was announced last year in UK's integrated review uh, as a core framing idea for the, for the UK's foreign policy, identified also a tilt to the Indo-Pacific as part of how the UK should try and navigate uh, itself in, uh, on international security questions. But since then, the war in Ukraine has put Europe and Russia at the heart of UK policy. The UK government argues that international security is changing, and that European and Indo-Pacific priorities are part of an indivisible agenda. But the scale of security challenges raises questions about how the gravity of limited resources and the pressing priorities may give developing these two policy areas simultaneously are a, a major challenge for the UK. Can the UK really balance engagements effectively in two regions at the same time? To address this question, I'm pleased to welcome to the webinar Birla Nowens, who is the Senior Research Fellow leading the Indo-Pacific Programme at RUSI. Welcome, Birla. And also Ed Arnold, who is a Research Fellow in the European Security Programme. Welcome, Ed. I wanted to begin, Birla, by asking you about the Indo-Pacific and how it relates to the UK's priorities. The, the, we've got a, also a new foreign secretary as well as a new prime minister. And one of the first areas that the foreign secretary visited was the Indo-Pacific with a tour of Japan, South Korea and Singapore. So clearly the signal is that the region remains high on the UK agenda. But why has this region become a priority for the UK and what policies are being implemented within this concept of the tilt? Yeah, thank you, Neil. I mean, look, if we if we think about um, the reasons why the UK is engaged and interested in the Indo-Pacific region and indeed why it came out with the Indo-Pacific tilt as part of the integrated view back in March 2021, I think. You know, it's made clear that 1.7 billion British citizens um, are in the region, um, hundreds and billions of, of uh, dollars of trade uh, are connecting the UK uh, to the region. Um, there's also, you know, that, that wider geoeconomic shift um, that's taking place, I think, at a global scale where the Indo-Pacific collectively in terms of growing and projected uh, GDP growth stands to be a significant driver of the international economy. And of course, we're seeing a growing middle class in the region that's boosting markets. And of course, we'll also have a knock on effects on the types of norms and values that um, you know, drive, drive the international system. So all of this has a, a wider geopolitical impact as well. And, and for, you know, for the UK to benefit from that, it has to also uh, I think, understand, and, and it, indeed it has, um, that for that you need peace, prosperity, and stability. A and the region does not come without challenges. Um, there are territorial disputes. 
there are, of course, issues around maritime security, be that on the environmental uh, side in terms of plastics pollution, in terms of illegal fishing, uh, and the knock-on effects uh, on you know, in, uh, food security, human security, but then also issues around, again, those norms and standards and rules that we all um, abide by, uh, as uh, outlined in UNCLOS, for example, on the need to reinforce uh, and support that as part of the rules-based international order. Um, so all of that, you know, in addition to climate change and some of these issues that everyone is facing really connect the UK to this region, um, just as much as we've seen other European countries also make um, that very clear. Now, in terms of the Indo-Pacific tilt, of course, it, in the integrative review, I think um, it was uh, rather modest. Um, I think it, it was clear in, in the drivers of why the UK is interested and also the areas in which it will engage and it would of course not do so alone. It, it um, I think underscored the importance of partnerships throughout really um, and the need that the UK cannot act necessarily um, independently to achieve all of its goals, both with partners inside and outside of the region, um, but really focusing areas of security, economy and also values. Um, I won't go through an entire checklist, um, but if we look at uh, you know, what the UK has achieved since March 2021, I think it's actually quite remarkable to look at the things that it did mention it was going to do. It has actually achieved um, most of those things that it had set out both on the security front and on the kind of more diplomatic economic front. Um, and within that short amount of time, that's quite impressive. Um, I would say that there are a couple of areas that are, I think are still outstanding, um, you know, greater engagement with some of the middle powers that it had mentioned. Um, when we look at, say, Malaysia or the Philippines or Thailand, Vietnam, some of these um, other Southeast Asian countries, I think, um, could warrant a, a bit more attention. Um, but again, you know, we're only um, a year and a half or so uh, in. And of course, we'll see review coming up soon of the integrated review. I think on the defense side, of course, um, we haven't necessarily got to the point of some of the, the latter ambitions, which is to say, type uh, 31 frigates, which um, would be in the region, uh, it said by the end of the decade, so there's still some time there. But I think on both the defense and um, economy side and the diplomatic side, um, you know, most of the achievements um, uh, are noteworthy. I think some of the engagements that the UK has been in, in terms of partnerships as well, is really exemplary in terms of um, some of these minilaterals that have come about, be it AUKUS um, on the defense side, defense industrial cooperation side, or otherwise some of these areas that countries in the region really care about. Um, things like uh, illegal fishing uh, or um, the blue partners uh, in the Pacific to try and coordinate um, some of the action that the UK and others are, are doing in the region to make sure that um, they are efficiently implemented and that nobody is, um, you know, uh, doubling up on their efforts uh, and that there is appropriate burden sharing in that respect too. So I think we're still seeing um, a, a shift and a working around um, some of the, the forms of implementation, um, but we've seen a lot of progress uh, so far, of course. And, and I think it's right that when uh, we look at, you know, James Cleverly, the, the foreign secretary speech recently, uh, he says that the UK has, has moved from strategy to um, delivery. I, I think he is right in that respect. The question is, of course, you know, what comes after this? Um, how, how does the UK plan for the region uh, evolve beyond this? Um, and that I think is what we'll be looking for, at least I will be looking for uh, in the next integrated review to see if there's any more um, evolution in that. Thanks very much for clearly a lot to get into already. Uh, could I just um, encourage those in the audience who want to ask a question, please uh, do start uh, sending your question through using the Q&A function, but we'll be responding just to written questions. Uh, and after we've done a round with the panel, I'll open up uh, to ask the panel to respond to some of those questions. So please do start sending them in now. But before we do that, I wanted also now to turn to, to, just to the European dimension. Ed, the integrated review was clear that the uh, Euro-Atlantic region uh, is and remains the core of, of UK security. And, and that was a signal already before the war in Ukraine. Uh, since then, of course, we've, we've seen an enormous attention on Ukraine and Russia uh, uh, in, uh, in London. How would you say the war uh, in Ukraine has shifted the UK approach to Europe and European security? Would you write and think 
to draw out of the IR, you know, the the comment that Russia remains the most acute threat to our security is key. And also our European neighbours and allies remain vital partners and that the Euro UK will be the greatest single European contributor to the security of the Euro Atlantic area to 2030, which also has a large NATO um, commitment. And I think talking about that and what's happened in Ukraine, I don't think it's necessarily shifted, but the approach has evolved from the baseline that was set out in the integrated review, which defined the ends in terms of the Euro Atlantic, but not really a great amount of detail on the ways and means. I think it's worth also mentioning that the integrated review, unlike previous reviews that the UK had done, was explicitly meant to be a guide for strategy, and it does ask to be judged on its actions. So I will go into a checklist, a very short checklist, uh, just because the some of these were not explicitly commitments within the IR. But if we look at what's happened since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I mean, the Jeff has increased in importance. It started to have leaders meetings and national security advisors meetings. So it's not just in terms of chief of defense staffs or MOD permanent secretaries. It deployed an operational headquarters to the Baltics and liaison officers across the continent. The UK further set out what it wants to do in the Euro-Atlantic with the defense contribution in the High North paper in March. Uh, signed a, a trilateral between Poland and Ukraine. And if you actually take the Jeff nations and Poland and Ukraine and color them all in on a map, it's very clear to see where UK priorities are in the Euro-Atlantic. Um, we gave security guarantees to Finland and Sweden as they went through their NATO membership application, which on paper were some of the strongest security guarantees that were provided to them. Reinforced Operation Cabrit, which is a NATO multinational battle group, both in Estonia with elements in Poland. Signed a bilateral with Lithuania and critically we've been flexible. So you know, very shortly after the attacks of Nord Stream 1 and 2, a couple of weeks ago, the Defence Secretary already committed to uh, getting two multi-role survey ships for seabed warfare to protect underwater CNI. So I really think that all of this activity has increased the volume of contact with European partners, uh, especially when taken on the baseline of a decrease from Brexit and then also COVID. And now in terms of the threat, Russia is the undisputed threat. So part of that has now meant that because of the volume and contacts with European and EU, it's higher, we're now seeing the product of that. So very recently, we've seen the UK join the first meeting with the European political community, uh, very closely after joined the EU PESCO military mobility project as a third party member, and also the language on the Northern Ireland protocol has started to soften. So there's definitely more common ground between the UK and the EU at the moment, and also bilaterally with key European allies than we've seen over the last couple of years. Thanks, Ed. I mean, what, what comes out, I think, of, of both of your sort of comments is a lot of priorities for the UK, uh, a lot of activity, and the way that the UK, I think, motivates this, and, and in particular, the need to become engaged in different areas, is this concept that security has become indivisible, uh, that one region and another region's security are, are interlinked uh, and require sort of simultaneous engagement. I wanted to push a bit more into this because this is really a kind of a foundational pillar, particularly I think Liz Truss is, is focusing on this idea and has advocated it. Birla, what does that mean, do you think, for the Indo-Pacific and how the UK approaches the region? Well, I mean, I think when we think about how um, the Indo-Pacific and uh, the Euro-Atlantic are interconnected, there's, of course, the economic side, you know, 60 percent of global trade goes through uh, the Indo-Pacific region, and that relies very strongly on um, uh, stability of sea lines of communication and the openness of those. Uh, so again, you know, going back to issues around um, standing by and upholding international rules and norms and laws around that is key. And so when we look at instability, be that in the Gulf, or we look at it, um, you know, around, um, you know, maritime zones as well, and such as those in the South China Sea or East China Sea, um, that becomes very um, potentially destabilizing. Um, there is, of course, also the issue of um, more generally um, China. Um, there, the fact that um, when we look at Chinese military modernization and professionalization goals, this is one thing, but the other question is, of course, how those are implemented and, and what they are used for to what end. Uh, and in that respect, you know, there's been extreme concern around Chinese um, uh, military behavior. 
um, in the region uh, deemed unprofessional by various countries. Um, there's issues around, of course, and concern around uh, Taiwan um, and cross-strait stability. Uh, and of course, we did see um, live fire drills uh, of, of a stepped up enhanced kind uh, most recently after the visit of Pelosi. Um, and related to China's rise, you know, beyond just the military aspect of it, there is, of course, as we've just heard in um, a lecture yesterday or RUSI, our annual security lecture, the fact that Chinese uh, data um, or data policies, I should say, uh, Chinese cyber and internet uh, governance policies, all of those are, are being um, rolled out through Chinese technology around the world, which sometimes can uh, pr prove problematic in terms of critical national infrastructure, in terms of um, privacy and data more generally and how that's governed and to what use that could be um, for the Chinese government. So all of these are things that, that impact um, us directly and also indirectly sitting here in Europe and in the UK. Um, and, and in that sense, I think that indivisibility um, can also be seen at what happens here in Europe and how that relates to the Indo-Pacific region itself. So the fact that, you know, we've seen, of course, um, the war in Ukraine, um, invasion of uh, a nation state, um, blatant disregard for international law in that respect, um, and that that has resonated with countries in the Indo-Pacific as well, um, not just around the possibility of Taiwan in future, but of course, also the fact that this sets a precedent um, that should not be set and can't be uh, allowed to, to be set. So in that respect, um, I think both in the economic and security realm, you see those, uh, those interlinkages. Thanks very much. And just to encourage everyone to keep sending in the questions, we've got some good ones already. We'll come to those a little bit later. Um, but before we do that, Ed, uh, from, the, from the European perspective, I mean, what do you think this indivisibility concept means from, for UK security? Well, actually, I, th I mean, I think it's very similar to what Villa has already set out. So I don't have a lot to add. I mean, it's just, it, you know, it's the principle that security issues can't be really confined to either region. And for the UK, we have a finite capacity. So when you're talking about resourcing both sort of macro regions and the sub regions within, you need to have as wide a viewpoint as possible. And that's not just in terms of defence and what you do with your military capabilities. It's also in terms of security and foreign policy, because it takes a lot of capacity to build up these relations with partners across the, the globe. Um, so I think looking at these regions separately is unhelpful in that regard. And it's not just a UK issue. It's also something that NATO is grappling with, the EU is grappling with, and also the member states that make up both of those organizations. A lot of new Indo-Pacific strategies and starting to look at the relative balance. Um, but then I think specifically to Prime Minister Truss, I mean, she's talked about a network of liberty for um, a while, and that was something that she started to talk about uh, when she was Foreign Secretary in terms of tackling authoritarian regimes, regardless of where they are in the world. And she's also been a very strong advocate for a global NATO, although that actually uh, hasn't been well defined yet. And also talking about the G7 acting as a sort of economic NATO, so very much I think the Prime Minister sees these global challenges as interlinked and very unhelpful to frame those in them as looking at those challenges just within either the Euro-Atlantic or the Pacific. I wanted to come back actually, Vera, to your comments about sort of how China is part of this in indivisibility agenda. Um, well, we, we heard, I think, just yesterday that the uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was uh, it wants to carry on sort of engaging uh, with China and, and they've got a visit coming up. In contrast to that, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, suggestion now that the Liz Truss is going to designate China as a threat to the UK. Uh, she spoke about this when she was campaigning uh, for the leadership of, of the Conservative Party and to become prime minister. I mean, what would that mean sort of practically for the UK-China policy and for the Indo-Pacific tilt? Because this is an upgrading of uh, the UK security posture towards China. It's an interesting question and, and an important one, because, of course, it is, I think, um, a, a, new a new take, a new turn in the type of language that the UK is using. So if we look at the integrated review, I mean, to say that um, China came out as not being a significant concern, I think would be incorrect. So, you know, China was noted to be a, a systemic challenge. 
um, in, in economic terms, a synthetic, uh, the, the greatest really systemic competitor to the UK's economic security. Um, there was a, you know, a mention that, um, that China's uh, rise is, is one of the most significant geopolitical factors this decade. Uh, and of course, I think the Defense Command paper and, and so many other statements so far have really outlined the concerns uh, around China and some of China's behavior uh, in particular, not China in and of itself necessarily. Um, so, you know, I think the UK has been quite clear that it needs to um, kind of compete where necessary, um, cooperate where possible, and then um, counteract or confront where, where absolutely required. And it has done so. So we've seen that in terms of sanctions. We've seen that in terms of, you know, public statements, be that um, alone or with like-minded partners. We see that in, in the ways that um, the UK is, I think, working with partners in the region to try and at least shape the, the regional environment as best as, as possible and help regional resilience. And then also back home in terms of uh, domestic capacity, you know, um, ring fencing or at least protecting um, uh, domestic industries, um, looking at UK academia, um, all of these are discussions that are ongoing. So it's, it's unclear necessarily what uh, labeling China as a threat will necessarily uh, really change. Um, again, in addition or, or aside from the fact that it's a huge diplomatic statement, um, you know, does this mean that there will be overall more funding going to, uh, to China policy, to China training, um, to understanding the China piece better? Um, that would be very welcome, absolutely. Um, but then we also see kind of contradictory things like, um, you know, the cutting of funding uh, for the Great Britain China Center, um, which is a, a kind of, a, I don't know what the exact term is, but a kind of loosely um, associated um, uh, body, which was set up to help um, bridge those, the, the, the two sides, uh, UK and China, and to help um, further understanding on both sides. So, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a confusing move. And that was done by, by Truss back when she was foreign secretary. So, um, you know, if, if China is to be uh, labeled a threat, then that needs to be in commensurate with um, funding uh, available to, to better develop policy, to better educate, um, and, and to um, really lead to, to something more substantial. But it's unclear to me necessarily what that actually will be in practice at the moment. And I know we'll get into this in, in a bit, I'm sure, but kind of budgetary discussions are, are complex ones, um, particularly at the moment. Yeah, I mean, and alongside the, well, the hardening position on China, the, the government has also suggested that there's going to be a, a review of the review, the review of the integrated review. I know, Ed, you've been following this discussion quite closely. Uh, and as part, I mean, the review, uh, I think, is, is, in, is in large part being, well, it's a new prime minister, but also because there's a feeling that the UK needs to reflect on the implications of the war in Ukraine and, and the increased demands on European security to review the the role of Russia. Uh, so how do you see European security and the UK's commitments to that being developed in this review of the review? Are we, are we going to see even more of a priority if we can say that on, on, on European questions as a result of this? I think going on information we have that's publicly available. So John Bew, who wrote the, uh, was the lead author of the uh, original IR is leading this part of the update uh, and the term of reference was to focus on to ensure the UK's diplomatic, military and security architecture is keeping pace with evol the evolving threat by hostile nations. So I think this update is primarily one uh, to look at global Britain in the competitive age, which is quite often referred to as the IR. Obviously, it came along with the Defence Command paper, which is more capabilities focus, and then also to a lesser extent, the defense and security uh, industrial strategy. So, you know, this is probably the first part of the process and the defense command paper will probably be updated as well. But in terms of the policy on Russia, I think it will actually change rather little. I mean, Russia is still the enemy number one. Uh, the update could list all of the terrible things that Russia has done in Ukraine, but it won't ultimately change the policy. And likewise, I think it's probably tell a better story of the threat that Russia now poses in all domains and sort of the thematics with evidence in terms of conventional threat, nuclear threat, cyber, energy security, food security, 
but again will it actually change the policy and actually my my worry and slight concern at the moment i mean the integrated review itself was delayed for a year due to covid and the disruption and the difficulty of articulating global britain in a world that was changing a lot but actually there's still multiple pathways to what this you know the war can take on the ground and also then what that means for the future president putin and also the russian federation in its current construct these things they, they are big questions in terms of european security and they are far from certain so actually again really changing sort of the strategy elements of the ir in such uncertain times i'm not entirely convinced of the value where i do think there's really important value is more on the defense policy side which underpins the foreign policy uh, so really focusing on the defense command paper because all of the analysis that was conducted about the threat that russia poses pre-February 24th was a net assessment which was focused on the physical and conceptual components of fighting power, sort of how many, how much personnel they have, what capabilities they do, doctrine, how they fight, not the moral components, which is leadership, morale, and an ethical foundation, which has been the complete difference between the two sides. So actually now we have a lot more relevant and timely data on actually how Russian fights and also the ability to develop a more detailed assessment of the threat Russia now poses conventionally to Eastern Europe uh, and also out to 2030 on the assumption that that's still the time frames of the integrated review. So then that has uh, that will have bearing on the approach to what the, you know, the UK takes towards European security. So I think we'll see a lot of continuation in terms of the policy from Prime Minister Johnson to Prime Minister Truss, all of the actions that I've already outlined will continue and develop and as, like I say it's a northern and then it's an eastern focus it's primarily in the naval and air domain not necessarily land but I don't think those parts will change what we really need to focus in on is the defense policy because it's got a long lot of bearing in terms of how we engage with our European allies and partners because they're all doing exactly the same and the big question is well, what threat does Russia now pose can Europe actually take more on its on its shoulders for its own security in the US less as it continues its pivot now that we actually know a little bit more about the threat that Russia now poses. Thanks, Teresa. I have one last question, I think, from me to, to the to the panel, and then we'll go to um, the questions from the audience. And I, I guess that my question is really the core one, which is, is this all believable? So, I mean, the government is making these announcements is going to be more on both regions, more activity, more priority for Russia, more priority for China, uh, both key threats. This is being said at the same time as literally by the hour, we're hearing how the UK economy is deteriorating and the prospects look increasingly grim for the for the next year. So, so I wonder just, I mean, is this is this double commitment, the indivisibility and delivering on indivisibility, really a sustainable and realistic policy for the UK to be pursuing in the next 12 months to two years? Perhaps, Ed, what's your thought? I mean, given, given the priority of Europe, the war in Europe, uh, is that just going to suck up all our resources really in the next, uh, next year or two? Yeah, I think there's real risks of overstretch militarily um, and probably diplomatically as well. It's worth noting that, yes, there's this commitment for 3% by 2030 and to get about to 25 by 2026. We haven't actually heard any of the corresponding spend on the FCDO, which is also going to be incredibly important. It's not just about defence capabilities, um, but the evidence that we're already seeing. So the UK uplift to Opcabra in Estonia already looks like it's going to have to scale down by the end of the year. So if we are struggling to you know, have a brigade minus deployment in Eastern Europe, it's not really good for optics. And also in terms of talking about persistent engagement, you know, we're supposed to be able to have a brigade headquarters to rapidly scale up to that. You know, the Baltics requested a division, so to uplift to a division, which is obviously pretty significant. So I think we're already seeing evidence of military overstretch potentially and also you know, with, with with smaller forces, the just the requirements, just in terms of exercises, there's always little redundancy. You know, could the UK put a division in the field? Probably, but it couldn't do much else. Can the UK form a carrier strike group? Yes, but it can't do much else. We need to be very clear with what we're trying to do. And, you know, again, coming back to the, the Prime Minister, 
who, as she was foreign secretary, who she was talking when the Lithuanian foreign minister uh, came to the UK and was talking about grain exports from Odessa. This was prior to the agreement that got the ports reopened. She was talking about that we'd be able to put Royal naval assets into the Black Sea uh, when Transnistria was an issue because it looked like Russia was able going to push um, west of Kherson and try and create that full land bridge like it had an intent to. They were talking about arming Moldova. Uh, these were at the same time as talking about enhanced support to Taiwan when global NATO was developing and also, again, the G7 acting as an economic NATO. I mean, there's a lot of ambition here, and I think it could outstrip capability pretty quickly uh, for the UK. I think, you know, we've already got the defence in the high north paper, the capabilities match. I think there is a strong focus also for the Joint Expeditionary Force AO. That's where we want to focus on within the Indo-Pacific. If we UK starts then also, you know, more activity in the Black Sea, MED as well, which we're still engaged heavily in, then yeah, there is a real risk of overstretch, um, especially as a lot of that 3% is not going to go necessarily on new capabilities. A lot of it's going to go on readiness, which is really expensive, but also stockpiles, all of the boring stuff that we've practically ignored for the last 20 years and actually replenishing our stocks. So it doesn't actually translate into far better capabilities, certainly not quickly. Yeah, and Vera, I mean, the, when the tilt was announced, I think the UK was very keen to, to highlight that this was a, a relatively modest, but, but it was going to be sustainable and something that could be delivered. I mean, you've, I think in your comments, suggested the UK has done very well on delivering that, but in this new resource environment, a uh, new threat environment, can can the UK continue to think to deliver on, on a tilt? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the, the most important thing is, of course, um, credibility, and you gain credibility by matching your words with actions. And so far, as I said, I think the UK has done really well on that. Um, but there have been, you know, I've had conversations with people in the region, and there are questions around um, whether security in the Euro-Atlantic region is going to impact the UK's long-term ability, medium to long-term ability to be able to really focus entirely on um, the Indo-Pacific region as it has originally intended to do so. I would argue that um, it probably can. It depends on how it's obviously going to be framed and what the UK promises next. Um, so as I said, I think it's in a really good place in the things that has already achieved. Um, I think diplomatically, you know, its diplomatic network, um, its engagement now in ASEAN as well and other regional structures um, is good. Uh, and that puts itself, um, I think, in a place where uh, it can engage at least diplomatically in these discussions. Uh, in terms of um, the, the kind of military footprint, obviously, as Ed has already um, alluded to, that it is a potential area of overstretch. But again, it depends on how the UK frames its engagement in the region. The two OPVs are there to stay for um, as long as you know, we can imagine for now. Um, and they're doing vital work in terms of capacity building, um, you know, building those relationships in the region as well, um, working on issues that the countries in the region care about. It's not necessarily about having a carrier strike group there every single year. Um, so there you know, are ways in which it can deploy on, in addition to that, there's, of course, also the significant presence that the UK already has in the Gulf and in the Indian Ocean region more generally. So is there a way that you can look at um, how the UK can maybe focus a bit more in the areas where it already has capability and presence? I would argue yes. Uh, and there are various ways that you can do that. Um, so, you know, this all, I think, comes back ultimately to implementation and to carry through. And in that respect, those partnerships are key. And as I mentioned, um, the UK has already put its foot in the door in, in quite a few initiatives together with um, cl close and like-minded partners, um, be that around the Pacific, around mineral security, around um, issues like illegal fishing, as I mentioned, infrastructure. So again, I think it's around what are the avenues for the UK to engage? It doesn't need to do all these things alone. And I think that message has been um, quite clear coming out of Whitehall in words and in and in action specifically. So, um, you know, I think I'm not necessarily um, that concerned around uh, the UK the region. The thing that it has to do is, of course, um, not over promise. And so far, I don't think it has. But again, the question will be, what does the review of the integrated review 
um, result in? What will the UK be pointing towards um, as the kind of next steps? And there, I think um, it'll be very uh, important to calibrate what it actually can contribute um, with the resources that it has. Great. I want to then start to go to some of the questions that we've been getting in and begin with one uh, by Ben Walters and perhaps just uh, expand it a little bit. Uh, so Ben raises a question about how the British Army fits into this. It's very much the resourcing issue. Uh, we've seen the army sort of go from being a well a land warfare uh, heavy force during the Cold War, then it's supposed to be an out of area operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, then begin to pivot back to Europe uh, and then uh, in the IR sort of some halfway house where there was going to be investment uh, in traditional land warfare, but also these rangers idea that would give the UK some global deployment. Uh, but sort of pulling back in a, in a wider spectrum, I wondered, I mean, if there are going to be additional resources for defence, uh, even if it might be relatively modest, is there a way for the UK to develop the capabilities that would allow it to play a role in both regions? And we saw a little bit, we saw that already, I think, in the IR with the focus on maritime, air and space. These are things that can be moved. They, they can be useful in Europe. They can be useful in the Pacific. Are we likely to see more of that, do you think, uh, Ed, going forward? And um, does this mean that the, the, the British Army you know, may in some ways be a relative loser in all of the resource investments that we're going to see? I think the army was probably already the relative loser in the original IR. Um, so in terms of the update and sort of how that addresses the balance, I think that there is acknowledgement that there does need to be an uplift and there's cross party support for that in the UK for army numbers themselves. But then it's also a lot on in terms of the capabilities, which I think, like I said, there's more data coming out of Ukraine in terms of how Russia fights. So the army needs to obviously take that on board. But I still think we're probably slightly early days to make very conclusive judgments on that. There will be certain things within the extant equipment plan that we all know that we, we shouldn't be doing and they should stop immediately. Um, there are some things that we should continue. And then we also need to start to look for new, new investments in terms of capabilities, but actually I don't think it's necessarily an internal UK decision. We need to look at what partners and allies are doing and how the UK will fit into defence within the Euro-Atlantic. I think for the time being, expeditionary operations, you know, the UK and other European nations are done with for now. Look at the NATO new strategic concept and all of the requirements from that. You know, it's talking about readiness of forces, you're ready to fight Russia and also a lot of mass. Yeah, we need to look at what the Poles are doing. They're spending eye-watering sums of money. Yeah, they're buying, you know, armor from Korea. They're buying, you know, Apaches. Their 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 arm army will be big, five heavy divisions. You know, we need to understand what they're doing at the same time to then reflect on what we're able to do and really stick to strengths, which, like I said, you know, within the Euro Atlantic is primarily naval, primarily. Uh, and where it is in terms of the army, it's, it is about smaller specialist capabilities. I don't know if they had a response on, on this question, but uh, uh, there's also another one, I think, which uh, is very much directed to you, which is you mentioned, I think, in your comments um, that the UK probably needs to do more on engaging middle powers. Uh, and I think this, this does, in a way, come off this question as well, which is uh, there's often a focus on big high end defense uh, equipment as being the kind of the standard by which we assess the UK's involvement in these different areas and you know sending the carrier to the Indo Pacific is one of them. But often it's diplomacy uh, and other uh, sort of uh, other forms of engagement, particularly with perhaps the middle powers that would give the UK leverage, um, wouldn't necessarily require such a large defense commitment, or certainly not a, a, a one that's permanent. Do you think there is mileage for the UK to do more in this area? And how would that help sort of increase the impact of the UK's Indo-Pacific policies? So I think quite a lot of initiatives that we've seen right now, which I, I think are um, you know, great, uh, great starts, um, tend to involve um, quite a few of the same countries in the Indo-Pacific. And that's not a criticism at all. Those are you know, countries with um, resources, capabilities, uh, that can get the ball rolling and and that's um, and send a diplomatic signal as well and that's great. 
Um, but you know, when I mentioned certain, uh, I think uh, a few kind of Southeast Asian countries, um, maybe a few others in say um, uh, South Asia as well, um, I think there are opportunities maybe to try and leverage some of those relationships a little bit more. Um, we talk about, you know, when we look at say the, the South Pacific, there's this um, continued, um, uh, I think, perception that um, some of these countries, some of these regions um, have not been given um, the, the kind of due um, uh, attention uh, that maybe others have. Um, and that is changing. Um, but again, I think um, it's important to kind of keep note of where you're engaging um, a lot and where you're engaging a little bit less and can step that up um, visibly as well. Um, and that doesn't need to mean uh, an entirely new initiative, um, you know, right off the bat. It can also mean working through ASEAN um, to focus on particular countries um, uh, as well and, and particular initiatives through that. Um, and, and it's exactly that, Neil. It's areas like cyber, it's areas like um, training around UNCLOS, um, it's areas even like English language training and armed forces, uh, things that the UK has done really well and, and already engaged in uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's, I think, just about um, enhancing that, giving it more visibility as well. If countries in the region, of course, are comfortable with that, that's another part of the equation. Um, but just enhancing those, those relationships a little bit more. Um, and that's only, I think, on you know, the more security side of things. There's also, of course, plenty of economic engagement uh, that I think um, uh, is, is possible and worth looking at further. So. Um, you know, areas of digital economy, for example, where the UK has um, done very well to, to engage in already, particularly with Singapore, for example, um, those are initiatives, I think, where there is appetite to do more uh, in the region. Exactly. And we see, of course, with Japan, this emerging uh, defence industrial relationship, which is really a major pillar of, of the UK's pivot there. So that, I mean, that's, I think, perhaps another area. Um, I want to ask you both also about, there's a question from Paul Hormuz, who uses a, this interesting metaphor, says Russia is, a, is like a hurricane, while China is like climate change when it comes to competition with the West. Uh, I mean, I interpret that to be, uh, maybe this, this points to a way forward in that, of course, the threats, they may be there, but the timing of them may be different. So clearly, we're going to have to deal with Russia in, in, the, in the immediate period. But as, as Ed has raised, you know, there are questions about uh, will Russia come out of this war with Ukraine as a significantly diminished actor? And of course, many others are stepping up on the European side. So there may be less urgency uh, in the future years with Russia and a chance to focus more on China. Do you, do you, see, do you see it in those terms, uh, perhaps beginning with, with Virla, that China is something that UK can gradually pivot towards um, and then uh, you know, Russia it sort of can, can fall away? Um, I mean, in an ideal world, I think that's what um, people would love to be able to pick and choose what they focus on um, at any given moment. I, I think that would be difficult. Um, I can't predict, you know, how the situation with Russia is going to go. But from uh, everything that I've read, and I've not, I am not a, a Ukraine or a Russia expert by any means, it seems that this is going to be a protracted situation. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a difficult um, judgment to make in that respect. What I can say is that I think, you know, it's it's true that in terms of the kind of long term systemic challenge, that is something that not just the UK, but many countries in Europe and elsewhere are um, are coming to grips with as well. And in that respect, you know, long term strategies need to be um, written up and they need to be written up now, not in 10 years time. Um, so doing a lot of that horizon scanning, not just um, for yourself in terms of your own national resilience, but um, you know, in a in a shared partnership, be that you know whether that be through NATO, whether that and, and understanding the impact of uh, China on NATO, and I think in that respect, it is absolutely right in what he said earlier as well. This is not about NATO going abroad, but about understanding what um, challenges China presents to NATO and, and the NATO uh, alliance. Um, it's about working through the G7, working through, um, you know, AUKUS, many of these partnerships already, I think, are having these discussions about how to secure um, things like access to um, uh, stable supply chains, access to raw minerals, um, putting forward a positive agenda around uh, norms and values, be it cyber, be it um, other areas of policy. 
Um, and I think that is that is certainly underway. Um, I guess the question is, um, you know, is, is that something that is being done um, entirely efficiently at the moment? Um, and, and there, I think um, we've got so many different initiatives that maybe streamlining um, communication between those uh, is probably required. Um, and just perhaps as a, a very self-interested flag, we do have a paper coming out um, on exactly this, um, probably in a month's time or so as part of a RUCI um, project with Chatham House on uh, transatlantic engagement in the Indo-Pacific. So do keep an eye out for that. But um, you know that, that discussion again around the China challenge, the long-term challenge that presents um, is underway. Um, I think the, the discussion also needs to maybe uh, revolve around um, flashpoints in the region. And if that does emerge, be it around Taiwan or be it around um, other uh, potential flashpoints, um, what does the UK do? Um, what does Europe do? Um, those are questions uh, as well that I think um, require further uh, consideration. I think there's just a sort of follow-up question that was related one from uh, someone who said remains anonymous, but I think they're really pointing to the question of, I mean, is this a mistake by the UK to now elevate China to being a threat, given th this long-term aspect, the fact that Russia is, is pressing on, on on European security very hard with the war in Ukraine. Now we're suddenly going to have a second major threat. We're going to have to try and balance resources. So, so perhaps it'd be better to hold off on raising the, the threat level with China, deal with Russia, and then come to this later on? Again, I think it depends on what, what that actually means in practice in terms of um, you know labeling China a threat. Um, so again, it might be a, just a diplomatic signal, um, but that remains to be seen. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, irrespective of what you label China, it is a reality that you need to deal with. And so I think, you know, in terms of continuation of policy, those things that I've already mentioned are already underway and that that should absolutely continue to be pursued. Now, whether I think and the question alluded to this, too, whether you label a threat and thereby China, you cannot cooperate with China. I'm not necessarily I don't I, I'm not necessarily clear that that's actually um, the case. Uh, you know, I think you can be clear about the, the, the extent of the challenge that China is presenting both at home and in, in, in the international community or in regions where you have partners and, and that you consider key to your own national security as well. Um, I think that's perfectly fine, be that under the label of threat or otherwise. Um, but you know, I think something that has been made clear in, in I think the speeches so far that we've seen coming out of government is you know, it is up to China as well to cooperate with the international community. Um, and I think it is fair to say that behavior has been deeply concerning um, and that that is very problematic and unfortunately does have consequences as well. Um, and so if that is lab labeling China a threat, then that is something that China must understand too. Um, but the door is open for communication. I think there's also things like climate change where you know, China can turn around and say, well, we're not going to work with you in that otherwise. Well, that's to the detriment of China too. China um, has severe um, environmental issues. Climate change directly impacts China, as it has said on uh, numerous occasions. Um, and it's a reality that it must to engage with. So, um, you know, I think I would move away from that binary, you know, position that if you label a country a threat, you can't then still talk to them or engage with them or work with them on issues that you must continue to work together on. Um, but that's a decision that China needs to make too. But it's important for the UK that if it feels that China um, poses such a significant challenge um, and that its behavior is so incredibly um, destabilizing that it um, says so accordingly. But that's a decision for the government to make ultimately. Ed, a question for you, I think on the, on the review of the review, uh, and this is about, the UK's uh, relationship to the United States, no longer called special relationship, apparently. Um, but anyway, I think the question really is, uh, what does the US want from, from the UK? It, it, is there a feeling that the UK should just be prioritizing European security? Or does the US want us to be uh, the global actor that the government seems to be focused on with presence in Indo-Pacific? Do you get a sense of how that aspect of the UK's alliance system will feed into this review? 
I think there's been mixed messaging from the US, US on this uh, in terms of the Defence Secretary quite a while ago now, actually, um, before the invasion, you know, he was he did make the comment in terms of the UK focusing on Europe and sort of that in turn and other activity enabling the US to focus more uh, within the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think what the UK has shown since the invasion in February is the military contribution it can make to Europe, um, not just in terms of the volume of support that we've provided, but critically the timing. You know, we were very early in sending um, military support and also the right type at the time. I mean, personally, you know, I, I actually didn't think what we were going to send early on would make a difference, but the way Russia fought, it meant that it did make a huge difference. And I think the UK has been really focused in on making sure that Europe doesn't match, but sends what it can. And I think that's really where the UK needs to focus on this update. It's really about influencing partners. So I think there's an element of avoiding complacency in terms of the threat that Russia uh, currently faces. And I think the UK are well placed to do that. I think there's also an element, and we have already seen messaging from the UK government, both the previous and this one, about maintaining that sense of urgency um, in terms of sorting out getting equipment. And then there's this real question that has never really, I mean, since I started specialising in um, European security has never really been answered, but it's just, it can be referred to as specialisation, burden sharing or division of labour. It is something that is revolved around certain issues. You know, defence procurement in Europe takes a long time. It's something that you never really make progress with. I think the threat that Russia now poses and the pacing threat that, that China now um, is, maybe this is the time to actually address those issues to so start to make, take more political risk about world specialisation, so, for example, not saying that we would do this, but in the UK, again, look to what Poland and Germany are doing and realise that we are not a continental land power. So cut back on land and invest in other areas. I think there's probably broadly more support for that type of approach. And actually what we're seeing with the rise uh, or you know, the proliferation of mini natural formats within Europe, for example, Joint Expeditionary Force that does have a capability component. Same with the um, German-led um, NATO framework nation as well. These questions are coming out. Again, they're still the same questions. It's whether the environment now is so challenging that we get the right answers. Thanks, Viral. I mean, what's your what's your reading of what the US wants from the UK and the Indo-Pacific, if anything? Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's comments were kind of taken out of context to be to be frank, I, I, I attended that, um, or I, I listened in on that um, that speech. And this um, was it, last year, the speech. This was last the, year, yeah. exactly. I think it was um, a double yeah. uh, lecture that he gave. And it was interesting because um, there was quite a lot of debate around this afterwards, around what he actually meant. Did he mean that the UK had to stay in Europe and that the UK would, uh, sorry, and that the US would take care of Asia, so to speak? And if, that, if that's what he meant by burden sharing. And I think the, the conclusion was actually not entirely clear. I think most people actually said that that was not what he meant. Um, I think what, what it was more about was that the UK obviously has limited resources and if anything would be a supportive role in the region. Um, but the region is of course um, incredibly vast. Um, so, you know, if we, if we talk about the Indo-Pacific, what are we specifically, what area are we specifically talking about? Now, if it's the Indian Ocean region, as I mentioned, the UK already has a military presence there um, and uh, arguably, I think, would be in quite a good position to um, do things like um, if there is instability in one part of the Indo-Pacific to ensure that stability remains uh, in the areas where it is present. It's not about necessarily shipping all your resources over to wherever the conflict is. It might be that you know, if the UK is present militarily in the neighborhood, then it becomes a question of will the UK be engaged? Will it um, leverage those assets um, to whatever um, you know, the, the, the US thinking is around how it should respond? Um, that's another part of it. But I don't think this is, again, I don't think that um, the defense secretary meant this as an either or situation. Um, it is simply about having a smarter approach uh, 
um, to leveraging what is already in the region. Uh, and again, thinking about what can be leveraged moving forwards, um, but not with the, the ambition, I think, for the UK to be a central player in um, you know, a, an Indo-Pacific um, contingency um, that I think will very clearly remain a US top priority for itself and for um, partners that are permanently based in the region to a greater extent, be that Australia, be that um, you know, Japan, for example. Um, so I, I think that just needs to be, you know, examined with a little bit more nuance in that respect. I think we've got time for one last question. I've just been looking through the list and um, obviously the UK is going through quite a, a moment of political turbulence. And Alex Murdoch, I think, has raised the question whether uh, Prime Minister Truss will actually remain in power for a long time. So I think, and, and this may go to the heart of the question, which is, I think the degree to which any British government, I mean, how much latitude does it now have on these questions? I mean, are we really seeing just national interests? I mean, the emergence of a set of national interests, which are about the Indo-Pacific and European security, they are indeed indivisible. And so we're, we're likely to see probably the broad, the broad structure that we have at the moment is likely to remain UK priorities, even if we have a, a shift uh, within the government, or perhaps even a shift to a different party. Uh, the Labour Party, I know, has highlighted that uh, in its own foreign policy it would put more focus on Europe. But uh, what do you think? What, what do you both think now about sort of post Brexit UK priorities? I mean, how much of a scope is there for for, for actually having difference from what we have today? Starting perhaps with Ed. Like I say, I think from the original integrated review and taking that sort of the overarching strategy, what we're seeing by, you know, we're seeing almost the strategy not organically develop, but sort of respond to the environment quite flexibly and start to fill in the gaps that some perceive that, you know, global Britain, the tilt and also the criticality of Euro Atlantic had. I suppose from my point, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one actually of, um, UK national security machinery, because actually it's very much dependent on the prime minister. The prime minister has a lot of authority. It's a highly centralized system. It's getting more centralized uh, with everything that's going on, you know, sort of buried on the cabinet office list of subcommittees. I mean, the National Security Council doesn't exist anymore. It's a foreign policy and security council. That might be a name change, but actually when you look at the sub committees and also the membership it's starting to centralize it's it's less people making these types of decisions so a very highly centralized system and the issue is actually and it you know it's in the integrated review on the chapter four implementation that it was all now the national security advisor national security advisor changed now so tim barrow his previous roles head of russia section um you know he's he's been in brussels a long time ambassador to kiev moscow and the eu that suggests that there'll probably be a little bit more focus on the euro atlantic but the issue is the machinery flexes to the prime minister and it probably hasn't gone through the full flexing from what prime minister johnson wants now it's going through the flex that the uh, prime minister trust wants and the problem is this machinery can't cope with that amount of change because the prime ministers are changing at a rate that we haven't seen in the uk for a long time so actually the machinery is in flux so there's a real risk actually with you know change fatigue and people busy operating and making sure that you know ukraine is supported and wider European security and in the Pacific things that there's actually just not a lot of capacity for that real thinking. So the strategy sort of develops not, you know, I wouldn't say on, on the fly, but actually it's flexible, it's responding to what's happened. And it's actually quite clear when you go back to the original IR document, you know, it, 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 it fits. The policy parameters are already there in terms of the activity that UK has taken this far. And Vera, on, on the Indo-Pacific, I mean, I guess it's the same question, really, and it's it's to some degree the degree, the level to which the UK is being pulled into the region as much as trying to sort of set its own agenda by de developments with China, but other actors in the region who are very keen for the UK to have a role there. I and mean, how much does that define the UK's policy, would you say? Um, I mean, <laughs> pulled into the region, um... Yes, but also I think the drivers, as I mentioned, are quite clear. And I don't think that that is necessarily going to change. 
Um, so I, I think, you know, as Ed has said, I think the parameters um, that the integrated review, I would argue for the Indo-Pacific tilt as well set out are, are still relevant, uh, are, are still useful. Um, and I don't expect much of a change, you know, should there be a change in, in leadership and um, should there still be a conservative party leader um, and a conservative party government. Um, and I wouldn't really expect um, that the kind of drivers necessarily or pull factors in that respect too would, would necessarily change. Um, but in a labor government, um, uh, a labor party government, um, I question uh, to what ex to what that would look like in terms of implementation. Um, so, would we militarily see more of a focus in that respect um, on uh, the Euro Atlantic region? And, and again, what does that mean for um, the Indo Pacific um, in terms of um, ODA as well? What what would that look like in terms of uh, a balance of of priorities, um, maybe with other regions uh, of the world? So, there might be some change there, but that's still uh, unclear to me. Um, I think also, you know, how China is approached. Um, I wonder what that would look like. So I think I, I would expect um, more of a change uh, if there is a change in, in party leadership um, in terms of government um, than if it's just about, um, you know, whether there's a new conservative uh, party leader uh, in government um, should Liz Truss go. But, um, you know, we're not there. Um, and so I think for, for the time being, it'll be really interesting to see what the review of the review actually produces in the end. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, but unfortunately, we run out of time today to discuss these issues. But I'd like to thank uh, everyone in the audience for joining us and for putting your questions to us. And we, I tried to cover as many as, as I could. I, I hope I hope that uh, I, got, I got to quite a lot of them, I think, either directly or indirectly. I'd also like to thank both Vera and Ed for uh, such stimulating responses to, to the questions and for, and for raising some more questions for the future. Please do join us for the next uh, discussion in the series on the 24th of October, where we're looking at 20th Party Congress in China and its impact on Indo-Pacific security. But for today, th thanks very much and goodbye from Rusi.